thanks everyone for joining this seminar, um, this uh, CSDMS seminar systems, as it's brilliantly known. Uh, if you're not if, if you're not aware of uh, CSDMS already, then I strongly encourage you to get involved in that group, um, especially if you like computers and especially if you like modeling or modeling is something that you do as part of your wider research. Um, this invitation actually to give this talk actually came off of a, a clinic that I gave at the last systems annual meeting, which was super fun. And um, this is my first plug of the talk. I'm going to be giving a clinic on deep learning methods for landscape classification at the next systems meeting uh, in May of 2020. So get that on the calendars um, if you're interested in that, in that sort of thing. Um, my name is Daniel Buskin. I'm at Northern Arizona University and I work on many topics, um, one of which is the application of machine learning to, um, I guess, lots of different problems. Um, in this particular example, it's coastal hydrodynamics. Uh, apologies if you tuned in or you signed up for this talk and uh, you, you were sort of hooked by the stream flow aspect. Um, originally, I had intended to talk a little bit about stream flow. Uh, but for various reasons, some of which are bureaucratic, uh, I'm not able to give that talk. So I've modified things slightly. I'm going to give a, a longer talk um, about continuous wave monitoring from time-lapse cameras using deep neural networks. But a lot of what I have to say has actually um, direct um, relevance to a similar application for stream flow. So what I'm actually going to be talking about today um, is continuous monitoring of, of nearshore waves. Um, in the surf zone, waves are actually relatively rarely measured. They are often modeled. Measurement in the surf zone is logistically very difficult and can be very dangerous, especially during storms. Um, and so therefore, uh, deployments such as in the photo here at the, at the sand motor, um, they, tend to la they, tend to, they tend to be short-lived, um, discrete in location, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so more often, uh, waves in the surf zone, at least the outer surf zone, through to the breakpoint, then and, and the swash, they're modeled. Um, but the the input, the boundary conditions to those models, uh, those numerical wave models and the circulation models that drive uh, sediment transport, morphological change predictions, uh, is a continuous uh, input of wave height and period in particular. Uh, they are the two fundamental quantities of waves that drive uh, nearshore numerical models. And those models are used, obviously, for uh, management operations and decision making. There's three uh, big areas that those models are used in an operational sense. Of course, there's risks of beach goes, uh, dangerous surf conditions such as rip currents. Um, safe navigation um, is another big one, uh, boating. Water quality is another big one. Surf zone tends to retain, retain very nasty things that can make you very ill. So for lots of reasons, um, continuous monitoring of initial waves is um, operationally and for research purposes an extremely important quantity to get a handle on and to measure basically as, as, as often and as frequently and as in as many places as you possibly can. So what I'm going to be talking about today is a, is a, um, is a proof of concept technique that I've developed with my collaborators over the last um, year or so that I'm calling optical wave gauging. It's a prototype technique for basic monitoring of coastal hydrodynamics. Um, so far, it's been tested on wave height and period, which is what I'm going to be showing you today. I've done some preliminary work with wave direction and also tide, which seems to be promising, uh, which I'm not going to show you today. Um, and all of this from relatively inexpensive time-lapse cameras. What I'm, what I'm after is a technique that is not so sensitive to the, um, the camera itself, the treatment of the data, uh, the, the, the camera geometry. I want something simple and relatively inexpensive. Um, so I'm, I, I want to develop a method that is able to uh, use consumer grade cameras. I want it to be configurable for estimating a number of different quantities from the near shore, especially those ones that have been traditionally very difficult to, to uh, estimate, such as wave height. Um, and I want it to be able to imp, uh, take as inputs uh, arbitrary images, things that necessarily don't have a regular spatial footprint, not necessarily always looking at the same scene, the same vantage, et cetera. And I'll talk a lot about that in this talk, about how, my vision for how, how we might get there. Very strange talking to a, a, a silent <laughs> anonymous room, I have to say. Um, so my talk outline, 
first I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what I call data informed physically based monitoring of near shore waves. Um, coastal imaging, video imaging of the coast has been a theme for several decades now. I think many, many groups have been working actively on um, measuring a whole suite of, uh, of, uh, of relevant near shore um, information, both hydrodynamic and bathymetric. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a data driven approach to the same problem which is what optical wave gauging is. I'll define the problem um, as estimating wave height or period from a single image and then as chaining those images or those estimates together to form time series. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the model design. Um, this isn't the, the low level computer science talk. This is very much the high level uh, coastal science talk. But um, I will talk a bit, a bit about the model, how it was implemented, how we trained it, and, and its, and its uh, relative advantages and disadvantages. The data sets, I've got three different data sets uh, that I initially tried this model on. Uh, the results and the implications for coastal monitoring is something I really want to talk about a lot. I'll make a plug for the software that I've developed uh, to implement this technique, which is, uh, is open source. And I'll talk about the journal article, which was uh, published um, um, is, is now in press in uh, coastal engineering. And in the end, I'll talk a little bit about where this research is going and how interested folks might be able to collaborate with me. My co-conspirators on this project have been Sean Harrison, who formerly at the USGS Coastal Marine Science Center, uh, now at Naval Research Laboratory, Senes, Mississippi. John Warwick, who's at the USGS Pacific Coastal Marine Science Center in Santa Cruz, California. Roxanne Carini, who I started this work with, um, she's at, she was at the Applied Physics Lab, um, University of Washington, now at the Marine Mammal Conservation Group, and Chris Checkerdale, who's at the Applied Physics Lab, University of Washington, and was Roxanne's PhD advisor. Uh, thanks especially to Chris Sherwood, who has been uh, very supportive and, um, and helpful during the development of this technique. I got funding from the Earth Science Information Partners, um, and the other funding mechanisms that I'm going to show up there for my project partners. So data informed monitor initial waves. Um, this has been the, do the dominant paradigm in coastal uh, remote sensing for, for a while now, since, since at least the early 90s. Um, this approach says, if I can obtain enough examples of data of remotely sensed waves, and design an algorithm to extract the information I need um, to inform a physically based model, i.e. extract, Im extract um, information from the images that then directly go into a physics based model or a parametric model that model that's informed by physics, then you can essentially make measurements from those, from those images. Oops, sorry. Um, so this cartoon really shows that process. You have your imagery, you extract features from that imagery, which usually requires that that imagery is, is set up uh, to collect in a very structured way. Um, and you combine those extracted features with theory uh, to generate time series of the quantity that you're interested in. This is very much the case for remote sensing of near shore with, with video. Um, imagery is very structured in its collection. The camera doesn't move. Typically, um, the uh, the, the, pic, the, the geometry of those cameras and scene is modeled heavily uh, in order to get a, a, a rectified image. You measure a physical quantity from that image or from a time series of that image uh, you know, that you can either directly measure from the scaled image, like a propagating wave, um, or you infer its physical properties from a statistical analysis. But it's, again, it's sort of a statistical physics problem. Natural surf zones are very complex. Um, and lighting is, is variation in lighting is a huge problem and variation of image features with respect to that scene can vary enormously. And so, so designing an algorithm that is robust to noise that can really capture the physics or that can really um, capture the image features that relate to the physics of the problem, that can be a very time consuming uh, exercise, but it has been um, used with success repeatedly in the coastal zone but with some important failings. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Stockton and Holman 2000 is a great example of using physics and statistics together 
to come up with a way to measure the near shore. Their, their focus was on near shore wave speed. They took a, a, a time series of Argus star images of the surf zone, cut a line through, and then stacked that line, the intensity of the image uh, along that line, they stacked that in time. So you get a cross shore image intensity uh, map that looks like that. It's a, it's a spatio temporal map of the intensity of the image associated with the propagating waves. And you can see the diagonal streaks in there is associated with those, those waves that are propagating in. If you conduct a Fourier analysis on that, on that data, you're able to tease out um, the, the, the amplitude and the phase as a function of cross your position. And with uh, principal component analysis, you take those, um, the first complex eigenvector associated uh, with, the, with, the, with the ordination, and you can relate the phase of the waves to the wave number and then to wave speed using physics. However, there's a number of different aspects to this, and I, you know, I'm not picking on this, me this method, this is very typical of many methods in the initial zone, that are essentially sensitive, very sensitive to, to, to image intensity and noise. Um, first, you have imperfect basis functions. It's difficult to model um, proper, real waves with sines and cosines um, without there being a lot of uh, energy uh, not associated in the spectrum with those propagating waves. In the PCA analysis, you sort of have to assume that all of the relevant information is in the first eigenvector, which is not necessarily the case. And when you're computing, when you're relating phase to wave number, you have to compute spatial gradients, which are very tiny and, and, and overly sensitive to, to, to noise. That's sort of typical of what I sort of talk, call the, the data informed approach or the physics informed approach. So structured imagery seems to be um, a key for a lot of these methods. There should be some structure to the data collection, you know, you know, fixed cameras, uh, therefore a fixed advantage, a fixed perspective, and a constant pixel size when you rectify the image. And various methods have been proposed for wave speed, uh, wave height, wave direction, um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Using arrays, either uh, looking at the intensity of one pixel over time, the intensity of the pixels in, in groups and grids and lines, etc. They all require some spatial uh, or, and geometric transformation of the imagery. Optical wave gauging is a data-driven approach that takes the data and then analysis is informed by the data, not by the physics of the problem. And that is essentially what machine learning is. It's a way to, um, at least in our field, it's a way to really circumnavigate uh, or circumvent the necessity, let's say, of, of requiring a physical approach to the problem, um, which is, of course, necessary if you wish to gain any, any uh, fundamental understanding of your problem. But is, I would argue, is not necessary um, if you simply want to just monitor uh, the, the phenomenon that you're interested in. And machine, way, machine learning is a way to map one type of data, in our case, instrumental observation of waves, to another type of data, unstructured images of those waves, or structured images of those waves. And a lot of the literature will tell us that this will work even if the relationships between the two data sets are extremely nonlinear, if the data is noisy. So it seems like a good op uh, opportunity to test this out in, in the surf set. And what a data-driven approach does that a data-informed approach does not, is that instead of optimizing the data itself, um, coming up with a way to manually filter the data or extract uh, some spatial information from the data or some temporal in information from the data in an organized and a structured way that relates to the physics of the problem, this time we don't do that. We don't optimize the data whatsoever. Instead, we're just optimizing the model. And in fact, all we're doing is, is, is facilitating the model to optimize itself. And that's what machine learning does. It's a way you, it, you set up the problem and it tries to figure out the answer on its own from the data by matching uh, or by minimizing the, uh, um, the discrepancies between the uh, observations and the estimates of those. And all deep learning really is, is very large neural networks. Machine learning um, has a number of different methods that it employs as a sort of a parent classification. 
of deep learning, one of which is simple neural networks of one layer, one hidden layer. Deep learning is, all it is, is just the uh, expansion of those neural networks on a huge scale. So you have many, many, many hundreds of hidden, hidden layers or even thousands of hidden layers uh, within the model that each need to be optimized uh, to, to minimize the discrepancy between the inputs that you're giving it and the outputs that you expect. So in our case, we take an input image, which is 2D or 3D, and we flatten it into a 1D vector. And on the other side of the, uh, as our inputs, and on the other side of the network, uh, we place the observed wave height or period or whatever the quantity is of interest. We use back propagation to um, adjust the weights and the biases of the whole wet network going back from the, uh, from the estimate all the way back to the, uh, to the input. By doing so, uh, we, we put on, in our hidden layers, we uh, place a number of different architectures that are designed to extract automatically the features from the images that are going to minimize the discrepancy um, between the uh, observation and the estimate. Those layers are typically called convolutional layers, and I'll talk a little bit about what they, what they are. So a data-driven approach um, to monitoring the initial waves says, if I can obtain enough coincident examples of actual wave measurements and imagery together at the same place, then I can teach a model to um, teach itself how to make those measurements from the imagery by first simulating those measurements. So the previous scenario of extracting features and then informing theory is now replaced by a simpler extraction of features that informs a model that is able to correct itself. So it's a slightly different philosophy, philosophy but I wanted to draw some parallels between the, the old or the traditional data informed approach and the emerging machine learning approach. So a data-informed approach needs data to develop it and to validate it, but it might only need a, a small amount of data to develop the method, and typically would use a large amount of data to validate the method. Features are manually or semi-automatically, or in some cases automatically extracted from those data, but the feature extraction is strongly related and obviously tailored to the physical quantity of interest. So it is obviously a physically interpretable solution that can be used for both monitoring and understanding the fundamentals of the problem, I think. Whereas a data-driven approach uh, likewise needs a lot of data to develop the method, uh, a lot of data to develop, uh, to validate the method, and prob probably a lot more data in general. But those features are automatically extracted this time. And a lot of the work then becomes into uh, designing the architecture that is gonna do that automatic extraction rather than uh, designing a, a, a statistical or physical technique that will do the extraction. And this time, uh, the, the model itself doesn't care about the physical quantity, it's just numbers. And so the question is, are those models physically interpretable? I'm excited at the moment. We're, I, I sort of feel like we're, we're at the start of the age of coastal remote sensing. Um, I've been out of, co of the coastal world for a few years, and I'm, I'm sort of slowly coming back into things because I'm excited about all of the, of the, of the new techniques that are out there and especially how the, the scale at which they're being applied. Um, a couple of examples I'm going uh, to show here. Uh, one is by Warwick et al. this year um, in landslides that used an amazing uh, four-dimensional time series of, of, um, of landslides in Big Sur uh, to quantify uh, that, that whole uh, catastrophic event and then to directly inform the management of where to put the road. Here's a, a figure that I took from a, a proposal uh, that really just illustrates how uh, a lot of, um, of amazing uh, geospatial technologies and remote sensing technologies are available to coastal researchers now. Um, as, as, as well as initial video monitoring, there are ways to invert the signals from video to estimate bathymetry, um, and breaking wave dissipation. And now with drones and UAVs and other types of aerial and satellite platforms, we're able to get higher and higher um, DEM resolutions, which are at larger and larger scales. And at really large scales too, from space. Uh, here's an example from Bishop Taylor, um, which has mapped the entire intertidal zone uh, of, the, of the Australian continent. 
here's another brilliant example from um, from Killian Voss, who's at um, uh, UNSW in, in, in Australia, looking at um, looking at how you might be able to extract shorelines uh, from Landsat imagery going back decades anywhere on the planet. But wave height has always been a problem. The traditional philosophy of extracting wave height from remotely sensed data using geometric feature extraction combined with a physically based model hasn't tended to work very well. Um, and no previous technique uh, proposed for wave height has been suitable from estimating from a single image. They always require time series images. Stereo imaging is, of course, um, a way to get at this. Um, in specific examples, but uh, when you have two or more uh, cameras with geometries, um, it is possible to use feature matching um, to, um, to solve the stereo correspondence problem. But it tends to be very sensitive to lighting and vantage. And it's also very computationally demanding. So it has so far tended to be applied at very small scales. I want to design a neural network that will automatically and simultaneously extract the features that best predict wave height and period from a single image. And I'm interested in the, I'm interested in the, um, the application of this model to estimate a, a, an operational quantity such as significant wave height, the, the, the average of the top third of waves, but use a, a whole image in order to, um, to estimate that quantity, even though that quantity might be varying over the image in time. So I'm interested in um, the problem of, in this, this particular example of image that I'm showing here, where the waves are measured way offshore, I'm interested in how we might be able to use the entire image to provide uh, clues that might better provide estimates of that quantity, even though the spatial location is not going to be constrained um, to the to the area in which that quantity of interest um, I, I want, if that makes any sense. Um, I'll, I'll go over that again in better, uh, a better way later on. But uh, I'm interested in the problem of uh, using that entire image and not clipping it by any means whatsoever. I want to use the entire image for my prediction. Uh, and, by, and I think I can do that by combining that time series of images with a, with, you know, a co coincident and co-located instrumental wave record like I've already said. Okay, so this is the part where I'm going to talk about the model itself. Um, I, I, I've already said that I'm not going to go into too many of the details here, but the, uh, the, the cartoon that you can see on the right explains the salient characteristics of the model. The, um, the outputs of every layer are the inputs of the next. And the, each, each block that you can see in that cartoon on the screen is actually, it can be expanded out into uh, its own neural network. Um, that each block there, uh, except a couple at the end, require uh, lots and lots and lots of layers in themselves. So the, the model itself gets to be very large and it's very difficult to show the models. So I've, um, I've cartoonized things here a little bit. The main, the, the main thing that, uh, the, the most important part of the model is the base model which is the base feature extractor, uh, extractor um, that um, through repeated application of convolutions and pooling um, is able to extract the features uh, from the imagery. It is an existing deep learning architecture that has been designed for generic feature extraction from imagery. And I compare a number of different ones. Batch normalization is for regularization, regularizing the model. Um, it takes uh, a batch of images during training um, that batch can, uh, I, I had any, anywhere between 16 and 128 individual images per batch. And by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation of the batch, you randomly introduce variation to the model training because every image is scaled slightly differently. So it simulates a scenario where you have a very, very extreme lighting contrast um, and brightness changes. Um, but by applying the different uh, by applying a different scaling to the model, the model is, uh, has to do better at generalizing what it can see, and therefore in the, the tendency for that model to overfit uh, is reduced. And that's what I call, that's what I mean by model regularization. The outputs of the base model are, regular, uh, are uh, normalized, and then um, they are 
pushed through a, a, what's called a max pooling layer. Um, there's an error there that the, it, it's actually a four dimensional stack that comes out of the previous layer and it returns a two dimensional stack um, of what's called activations of the network. Then randomly half of the neurons of that activation are dropped. Again, in order to prevent overfitting, uh, I don't want the model to just learn, um, learn uh, by memorizing, I want the model to learn by generalizing. And then finally, the, the, the fully connected layer, that's your standard multi-layer perceptron that is connected to every uh, neuron in the previous layer and that does the estimation. The model is set up such that when the features that arrive at that dense layer, uh, uh, sorry, the features that arrive at that dense layer are linearly scaled to the quantity of interest. The first data set comes from a place called Sunset State Beach near Watsonville in Monterey Bay near Santa Cruz. Um, the time series here collected by Sean Harrison and John Warwick at USGS uh, has been going on for several years. Uh, the data set that I used um, coincided with an ADCP, ADCP deployment just offshore of the, of the site in about 10 meters of water over two months. Uh, the time series that you can see there, I think, is every image over that two months. The wave height increased uh, from, uh, varied, sorry, from about 40 centimeters to about two and a half meters, peak wave period between about seven and 23 seconds. And that was measured in about 10 meters of water just offshore. Uh, an image was collected every 30 minutes, and the ADCP measurements uh, were 20 minute bursts every hour. So the, um, so the uh, ADCP data had to be interpolated over the um, image timestamp. And I just used the, um, the most oblique camera too. This is a two camera system. Okay, and what you can see here um, from left to right are example images associated with increasing wave height on the top and increasing wave period on the bottom. Uh, you can see that um, for large wave heights, uh, you tend to get a wider surf zone. Uh, of course, the waves start breaking further out. This is a dissipative beach. Um, and for different periods, you can see that this, uh, you get a variation in the number and the spacing of the breakpoint, and possibly more energetic breaking too. Um, data set two is actually the same data, but this time I've combined um, two, the two oblique camera views and rectified them onto the horizontal plane and merged them together. So we have an ortho mosaic um, of, of the scene. And this is, uh, of course, covers a, a larger area. This is about uh, one by one kilometers this time. And by putting the, uh, by, by transforming the imagery onto a regular footprint, you can see, um, you can see very much the, the, the faces, that are, the, the shadows that are caused, that, that, that occur on the front face of the waves, um, more than you can in the oblique imagery, but you still see the same energetic breaking associated with larger wave heights. And for longer wave periods, uh, you, you do tend to see more organized crests, as you'd expect, uh, more regular spacing, and, and of course, a wider surf zone as well. So there is a diagnostic texture um, in these images that we're hoping that the computer can exploit. But why, why compare two sets of imagery from the same site? Well, that goes back to this question about whether or not uh, the machine learning model really does need to know the physical dimensions of the pixel or the image, or whether those uh, dimensions need to be consistent. The computer science literature would definitely imply no, but uh, there are very few studies at this point uh, in the application of deep learning in, this, in, in these sort of natural systems. So uh, we made answering that question part of the study. The third data set comes from uh, Roxanne Creaney's uh, infrared camera deployment at Duck. Um, the imagery comes from a close range thermal camera. So this time, uh, you can uh, the, the, the relatively light portions of the image there are relatively warm, um, but there's a, a, a great textual signature uh, of the sea surface that's associated with, with different um, ranges of wave energy. This, da this data set um, came from just two days during a storm that hit Duck, North Carolina. Um, about a thousand oblique images over 10 and a half hours were used, and the, uh, a LIDAR that intersected the field of view was used um, by Roxanne Carini and her PhD. She actually uh, came up with a semi-automated method to uh, estimate the individual wave height period from each wave. And the, the ranges there are therefore very large because this time we're not looking at a statistical quantity, 
we're looking at the individual waves themselves. So as the, um, as the wave, wave height increases, um, you get uh, um, larger, sorry, decreasing patch sizes. And as the uh, wave period increases, you get increasing sizes of patches of relatively warm water. Okay, model implement implementation training. Um, as I said, I'm not gonna talk too much about uh, a lot of the sort of myriad of details that go into training a machine learning model like this, other than to say that the paper goes into details, uh, a lot more details, and that I use TensorFlow 2 with a Keras front end. Now TensorFlow is, is, a, is a model, for, is a Python software for implementing deep learning, and Keras is essentially a, a, an easier to use functional API that sits on top of that. The imagery was cropped to very small dimensions um, because very large batches were used during training um, and we had to make sure that um, up to 128 um, training images and 128 validation images could be held in GPU memory, which is notoriously expensive. And instead of buying more memory, we just downgraded the size of the images. But uh, subsequently, we looked at larger images and it hasn't uh, affected the results too much. But this brings in the question, uh, can, we, can the model extrapolate beyond the range of the training data? So in order to answer that, and this was a suggestion of Chris Sherwood's actually, um, we, we excluded the top and bottom 5% of wave height and periods during model training to see how well um, the, the trained model could do at predicting those images. And this, of course, is simulating a scenario where you're not able to collect enough images um, or, or the, the full range of variability um, of your wave height and period, which obviously necessitates um, um, sampling for longer in many cases. Of the remaining 90% of the data, 60% we, uh, we use the trained model and 40% we use the validated model. So about 54% of the entire data set was used to train the model in the end. Now I'm getting onto the results slides. I'm going to show you a series of uh, slides that look a little bit like this. We've got 16 plots. Um, I, I tested the technique with four different models, base models, and four different batch sizes, hence the 16. And um, each one of those plots shows the actual wave height or period versus um, the predicted. The black dots are the validation data set, and the blue crosses are the extremes, the, the, the bottom and top 5% of, of the quantity of interest. Going uh, from left to right is increasing batch sizes. So that's just the number of images that you give the, the, the training um, in each epic. And uh, going from top to bottom is increasing model size. Um, some of you will be familiar with those names. Those names don't really mean anything other than they are models that are sort of established in the computer science community and are being rapidly adopted by the earth science community. But those models actually um, have a very, very different numbers of parameters and their architectures are very different. Um, the mobile net mo model has about a million parameters that you can tune. The Inception ResNet version two model has, uh, I think about a 60 million uh, parameters you can tune. And we, for each, each one of the data sets and the quantities, we looked at the best performing um, uh, model just in terms of RMSE. The best performing in this particular case was, I gave an RMSE of about 13 centimeters and about 18 centimeters in the out of calibration validation. So that was the, the they're, they're related to the blue crosses that you can see there. And you can obviously look at this in time series as well. Um, this is a time series from the, um, from the sunset uh, state site. First week is shown there in set. And you can see that it tr the, the model tracks fairly well. These are, these are the uh, validation images. And, but you can also see that because we left out examples of extreme waves, the model does tend to underestimate those peaks. This is the same uh, site, but this time for wave period, uh, the best performing um, RMS error was actually sub-second, which we were pretty happy about. Uh, not so good for the out of calibration validation. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Anyway. But again, you can see a, lot, a large variation in accuracy as a function of model type, batch size, 
number of parameters. So part of the challenge in interpreting the, these results is, 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 is making a determination of how big your model needs to be and how big your batch size needs to be. But so there's a strong indication from these results that the batch size does not, to be, not need to be very large. So for the author mosaics, um, we're getting down to 10 centimeter RMSE. For wave period, sub-second once again, but again, each, each, uh, each best model is a slightly different uh, model, base model and batch size. Um, and then for the, for the infrared obliques, the wave height tends to do really well, especially out of calibration, which is really surprising. Um, and the wave period does really well within calibration, but the model does not generalize very well. Um, so it's therefore not able to predict wave period with uh, particularly good accuracy um, out of calibration. And I'll talk a little bit about why. But just to summarize all of the best models per data set and per variable, um, if you were to pick and choose, this is the accuracies that you could possibly attain between about uh, nine and 14 centimeters on wave height for these particular data, um, increasing to about 12 to 23 centimeters uh, for out of calibration validation. And then for wave period, slightly worse, a little bit more scatter in general, and, um, but, but overall, pretty good, reasonably good anyway, um, at least out of calibration. I wanted to draw in, uh, attention to this um, scatter of points over here that you can see highlighted by the box. The, um, the, the wave model for wave period, the infrared imagery did not do very well, um, likely because the field of view is very small. And we think that the, uh, I'll, I'll explain in the next slide that, um, we think that the model is actually using wavelength to predict wave period. Um, and because the field of view is actually smaller than the wavelength, uh, in this case, in the outer surf zone, um, then that might explain the massive discrepancies there. Okay, so the accuracy take homes is that the model is sensitive to the, to the choice of base model, but all base models work. Since the paper, we've actually um, explored several other base models. Um, and, and one of those is implemented in the new software. Um, it's, it's less sensitive to batch size, I think, than base model, but, but especially for wave period, there's a strong sensitivity to batch size. Um, and the optical wave period prediction is reason, reasonably good for out of calibration for wave height and not so good for wave period. So the, going back to that research question that I proposed earlier, uh, can the model be used to extrapolate beyond the range of training data it did actually work surprisingly well for wave height. Um, obviously those features that are that, uh, scale, um, that it's able to extract, not so well for wave period, those features don't necessarily scale. But it's, I think it's unreliable at this point, it needs a lot more work. Obviously there's the, um, the option of uh, just recording more data so you capture more storms or more quiescent periods, but in the end I think it's gonna require um, some different approach in order to be able to reliably and predict outside of its calibration. So going back to the research question, does a machine learning model need to know the scaling? Um, it does need to know, uh, sorry, it does not need to know, um, sorry, it does not require a regular pixel size. Um, the oblique imagery worked just as well as the rectified parametric imagery. Uh, also, we found that the uh, model we kept the, the aspect ratio of the imagery constant, but when we tried playing with that, um, it didn't affect the model as much as we thought, um, but obviously that is preferable. Uh, but the model, of course, does require a consistent scene. When all the models were trained, the one, one model did not predict another site very well, therefore the models were not transferable between sites. They were obviously dictated by the data that they were trained on. Therefore, the models are sensitive to, the, to very large changes in the scene, such as changing the zoom or the orientation. But the models are not sensitive to small changes, in the scene, such as caused by vibrations, small vibrations from a road or from wind, etc. Are the models physically interpretable? And this is a question that's on everybody's lips when it comes to deep learning, not just mine. And um, there's a few uh, different ways that you can get at this. Um, one, one of which is called class activation map. And there's a way to, to visualize what neurons are being activated as a result of 
uh, of the model training. Um, an activation map, in this sense, is just a two-dimensional um, a raster of, of, of pixel values that looks very much like the image, uh, the input image. Um, relatively bright uh, Im uh, pixels uh, imply relatively important for estimation. The activation map that we arrived at uh, as a result of model training is shown on the right, and the activation map that we started with is on the, on, in the middle there. Um, if you were to use that activation map, that would be called transfer learning. That would be uh, essentially starting with um, a set of weights of the deep learning model that's been inherited by some other training process. And what we saw was that, um, that the, we thought that the model was physically interpretable in this case uh, because we saw consistently when wave height increased, the surf zone width increased, that the pixels that were being uh, uh, highlighted by the, uh, or activated by the network um, tend to be near the shoreline. Uh, this is a dissipative site, so the, so the surf zone is saturated. Therefore, it makes physical sense that the surf zone width would scale to wave height because wave height is, is, dominant, is controlled by water depth. This time we've, we're showing uh, images uh, with, of increasing wave period. Um, this time the activations were relatively bright offshore. Um, as, as the wave period uh, increased, the um, I'm getting computer issues here. Uh, as, the, as the wave height increase, uh, there is uh, more and more of the shoreline is sort of masked out, and more and more of the offshore period, uh, areas are therefore uh, more important to the prediction. And that may also makes physical sense. We think that um, if the model is able to estimate a wave period from wave length, which it can see, that makes physical sense for this because it's in shallow water, therefore the uh, wavelength is proportional to the wave period. But we think the biggest downside is the morphological variability. We think that because the um, model is used in shoreline areas so heavily, um, it could be very sensitive to the beach morph dynamic state and therefore the, uh, and the relative shoreline position. Therefore, we're recommending that, um, that optical wave gauges be trained using data over multiple seasons and years. And that's what we're looking at now. At the sunset site, we're lucky because we have um, a pretty good relationship between the measured waves at sunset and the operational wave forecast by the CDIP MOPS um, model of, of the whole California coast, the operational model of Scripps Oceanography. And I wanted to make a plug for, um, for a recent master's thesis um, that has um, show, documented how variable this site is over the course of about 18 months. Um, with the shoreline varying over about 50 meters over that time and the sandbar, uh, the offshore sandbar location varying about 100 meters. So the, these state, state data we're going to be incorporating into our model and training and retraining it for different time periods and seeing if we can incorporate the morphological variability there. So just wrapping up now, uh, the software is available online on my GitHub site. Um, it replicates the journal article result and it does more. Um, it does require a GPU to run, at least to train, but no GPU is required to, to make predictions from an existing model. And I've made some Jupyter notebooks that can run in Google Colab if you don't have access to a GPU. The coastal engineering paper is now in press and the link is there and I think will be sent around with the video afterwards. So we're, we're happy about that. Um, and the next steps, um, there's, there's a number of next, next steps beyond looking at the model sensitivity to time and morphological variability. We're also interested in um, exploring whether or not this approach can be used with any, time, uh, with any consumer grade camera, which is the real hope. Um, and whether or not we can make predictions in real time by uploading the model onto a camera system. And by having this model um, sort of set up using TensorFlow, that makes things a little easier because there are existing technologies that allow us to, uh, for example, port our model onto a smartphone or a single board computer that might control the camera. It's called TensorFlow Lite. And um, another thing that allows us to um, 
to serve our models through internet um, uh, servers, TensorFlow.js. So there's, there's some potentially some um, interesting and some exciting things on the way. And I wanted to draw some um, parallels to some other work that's being um, done on the other side of the world by Mitch Harley and his group, um, a recent paper in, again in Coastal Engineering, CoastNAP. Um, this is citizen science beach monitoring, um, encouraging folks to put their cell phones within a, within a frame there and to take a picture and then over, and give that to the scientists. And then over time, they can use that data to see how you know, the beaches are changing. I wonder if optical wave gauging could be used to crowdsource wave monitoring. You know, you can conceive, conceivably think of a situation where you have enough images from folks that have contributed their imagery, that might be a possibility. I'm interested in exploring that more. And the reason why I talked so much about structured versus unstructured imagery is because we're in the age of drones. Um, there's lots of uh, coastal uh, research and monitoring that uses drones. And I wonder if it's possible to obtain sign time series of wave properties from a stationary drone. Or how about from space? I think these, um, these, these applications would obviously require quite a bit more work, uh, especially developing uh, something that wasn't so sensitive to the camera's specific scene, vantage, and pose. And I think those sort of generically applicable techniques, they're, the, they're sort of towards the things that um, is popularly known as artificial intelligence, where the computer is able to do something a lot you know, smarter than, uh, than, than it's currently able to do and actually mimic the sort of behavior that we can, um, that we can get with our eyes and brains. Thank you very much for listening.